50 days that changed the world. And those 50 days are divided into two sections, 40 days and 10 days. 40 days, Jesus was on the earth after his resurrection. 10 days, they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's the 50 days. So the title of this message is called Waiting for the Promise. Now I wanna ask you a question. You can raise your hand if you want to. Uh, every campus, every gateway gathering, everyone online, how many of you have ever waited for something? Can I? Okay, that's like the death rate, 100%. How many of you have ever waited for someone? Can I see it? How many of you, the person you've waited for is sitting beside you? Can I'm just... I just wanted some interesting conversation in the car on the way home. <laughs> now, you don't have to raise your hands on this because you would all raise your hands, but the next question would be, how many of you have ever waited on God to do something? Yeah, all of us, right? Okay, I wanna give you a theological truth. Y'all know I'm a theologian, love theology. Let me just give you a theological truth to help you as you wait on God. God owns everything except a watch. <laughs> God does not have a watch. I gave him one one year for Christmas <laughs> and he threw it in the ocean. You know those, you hear about scuba divers finding watches on the bottom of the ocean floor? Those are the watches that God throws away that people gives him. God does not have a watch, but he's never late. He's never late. So we're gonna talk about these 10 days. And I'm gonna tell you what the last words of Jesus were before he ascended. 40 days he's on the earth. And then right before he ascends, he tells his disciples to do something. But most people get it wrong. Most people quote Matthew and Mark, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So they say the last words of Jesus begins with the word go. Not true. Luke and Acts 1, last chapter of Luke, 24, Acts 1, record the last words of Jesus right before he is taken up. His last words were not go. His last words were stay. and wait until you're endued with power from on high. Because if you go before you get the power, nothing's going to happen. Let me read these to you, Luke 24, 49. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, wait, that's that word we all love, for the promise of the Father. Okay, so let me just admit something to you. I don't like to wait. Actually, that's not true. I hate to wait. You know what I hate more than waiting? Hurrying up to wait. <laughs> hurry. Our reservation is at six. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Then when we get there, why are we waiting? What, why are we waiting? Did you call? Did you make the reservation? It's 6.05. Why are we waiting? I'd like to go up to the manager and say, why are we waiting? but I can't do it because the whole restaurant is saying, hey, Pastor Robert. <laughs> I'm full of the joy of the Lord right now. <laughs> I hate to wait. Anyone feel that way? But we all wait. So I'm gonna answer the question in this message of why does God make us wait? 
why couldn't Jesus have stayed 50 days? Why did he stay 40 and make them wait 10 days? I'm also gonna answer a couple other questions that you might not have ever even thought about. Where did they wait and how did they wait? In other words, if you're waiting on a promise from God, where should you wait and how should you wait? And then we're gonna talk about why do you wait? So here's part number one, where did they wait? Now, don't answer it because you'll get it partially right. You'll get it partially right. I asked a few people this question this week. They got it partially right. Where did they wait? They all said the upper room. That's partially right. By the way, the upper room was not the same room they had the Last Supper in. That was an upper room, not the same one, because this upper room held 120 people. There were 120 there on the day of Pentecost. There were the 11, they nominated another one, they got 12 then, and then they had the 70 others, and then it makes very specific mention, it mentioned the ladies who were there as well, as well as it mentions Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's the last time she's mentioned in scripture. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there for the birth of Christ and for the birth of the church. Because the church was birthed in Acts chapter two. So Acts 1, 12 and 13 says, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, that's right, this right after he ascends, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. I'll just explain it for those of you who wanna know what that means in a moment. And when they entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. That's why people think they were in the upper room for 10 days. 10 days, they were there. They never left the upper room and they sent out for Chinese, you know, during the 10 days. They never left that room. I'm gonna show you they did. A Sabbath day journey. Um, it was not the Sabbath. It was the day before the Sabbath when they were waiting. Um, but it wasn't the Sabbath. And um, when they went into the upper room, the Sabbath day journey simply means about three quarters of a mile, but they didn't say it that way. It was either 2,000 cubits or 1,000 steps, man steps. A cubit is from the tip of your finger into your elbow. That's 18 inches. So that'd be 2,000, a half of that, 1,000 of those would be 36 inches, which is about a man's gait, okay? So that's, that's all it was. It was a, a made up law that um, the, the, on the Sabbath, you could only walk 2,000 cubits or 1,000 steps. And so it's just simply saying they, they went about 1,000, they went about a journey, a, a Sabbath day journey, it's all the same, okay? Now, so upper room, but that's not where they were the whole time during the 10 days. Because Luke, again, records this, Luke 24, verse 52, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God, amen. In the temple, upper room. Now, this word continually, by the way, I don't, I'm, I, I don't want to get too far into, I told you about the cubit and all that stuff. I know I can get too far in detail, details, but the, it, they were continually in the temple, not continuously. Now, I'm glad the teacher stood up because they'll know the difference. Continuously means 24 hours a day, never left, never ceases, no breaks. Continually means frequently, often, you know, if you say you continually talk about that, you frequently talk, but you can't say you continuously. Okay, never mind. All right, so now everyone understand the difference. And I'd really like for you to use the correct word if you're around me, okay? <laughs> so, all right. So they were most of the time in the temple and they were in the upper room. The church began in the temple and in the house. It is continued in the temple and in the house. If you only have church in the temple and for the other six days of the week, you don't have church in your house, you're missing something. But even though we're coming out of this season of COVID, and I do believe we're coming out, if you only have church in the house and never get back to the temple, you're missing something too. Because it's good to come together. 
So we need it both. Let me show you some scriptures. Acts 2, 46. So continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Acts 5, 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay, so this is all through scripture. In the temple and from house to house. Paul said about five times, but I couldn't, I didn't want to take the time to read all the scriptures. Greet so-and-so, Aquila and Priscilla, and greet the church that is in their house. So they met in the temple and they met in houses. But is there a deeper principle? Yes. The deeper principle is when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, oh, that's easy. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second, he said, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let me sum up those two for you. Relationship with God and relationship with godly people. So I'm answering the question, where did they wait? I'm answering the question, where should you wait if you're waiting on a promise from God? And all of us are waiting for a promise in our marriage our business, our health with one of our kids, we're all waiting for a promise. Where should you wait? Here it is. I'm not saying just in the temple and from house to house. I'm using the principle. The principle is you need to wait in relationship with God and in relationship with God's people. That's where you need to wait. You need to maintain, if you are waiting for a promise, you need to maintain your relationship with God and your relationship with God's people. That's very, very important. Or you might not keep waiting for the promise. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, been here several times. One of the times he was here, he used this illustration. He said, when you land on an airplane and they say you can turn your phone back on or take it out of airplane mode, you'll see normally on many phones a word at the top left, it says searching. And then it has dot, dot, dot which means that there's another part of the sentence. So he looked it up to see what it was. Here's the whole sentence, searching for connection. And this is what Dr. Cloud said. Every human comes out of the womb searching for connection. There is something in you that God wired. You are searching for connection with God and with people. Jesus said, on these two commandments hang the whole law and prophets. I've already told you what that meant. That's the Bible. The first five books and then the major and minor prophets. Here's what he's saying. On these two things, here's, you wanna, you wanna sum up the whole Bible? Have a relationship with God and have a relationship with God's people. So where do you wait? You wait in relationship with God and God's people. So here's number two, how do you wait? How did they wait? Acts 1.14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, let me just let you know what prayer means to ask. Supplication means to intensely ask, to ask fervently, to ask passionately. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much, okay? So that's what supplication means. But I want you to understand prayer is a huge part of the church. And it's not this, um, I have to do it, I need to pray. It's communicating with God, presenting your petitions, talking to him, and when you talk to him, you can release the burden that's on you. And if you don't pray, you will still have the burden. And you will continue to carry the burden until you give it to him. Prayer is how you transfer a burden to him. But I want you to notice how prayer continued through the New Testament, uh, through the book, just the book of Acts. And I've only, I didn't do all of them because I didn't have time. I got just enough for one screen, okay? So I'm not even gonna say the verses, just the chapters, just so you'll see, watch this. Acts seven, Stephen prayed as he was being stoned. Acts 8, Peter prayed for the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus prayed after his conversion. Acts 9 again, Peter prayed before he raised Dorcas from the dead. Acts 10, Cornelius prayed that God would show him how to be saved. Acts 10 later on, 
Peter was praying and God told him to answer Cornelius' prayer. Acts 12, the believers prayed for Peter when he was in prison and we know the gate opened. Acts 13, they fasted and prayed before sending out Barnabas and Saul. Acts 16, they were praying and God opened Lydia's heart. She was a very prominent person in the city and it opened the door for the gospel. Later in Acts 16, on the way to prayer, Paul cast the demon out of a girl, which also opened the way to the gospel. Later in Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in prison and they were praying and God opened the prison doors. Acts 20 and 21, Paul prayed for his friends before leaving them. Acts 27, during a storm, Paul prayed for God's blessing. And then Acts 28, the last chapter of Acts, after the storm, he prayed that God would heal a sick man. Prayer was a major part of the New Testament church. The farther we get from prayer, the farther we get from receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when I say receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit, let me me just say, it's almost like, it's like a one-time thing. Yes, we receive Jesus as our initial savior but there is a continual receiving Jesus every day as Lord, not for salvation, but for whatever we're going through right then. There is an initial receiving the Holy Spirit, but there is an initial, I mean, there is a continual receiving the Holy Spirit in every situation we're going through in life. But it comes through prayer. Watch this, you wanna see how the Holy Spirit comes through prayer? Let me just show you again in, the, in Jesus's life and in the church. Luke 3, 21, when all the people were baptized, it came past that Jesus also was baptized and while he prayed, most people miss those three words. While he prayed, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. The Holy Spirit came when Jesus prayed. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit comes when we pray. And I know you're thinking, but I have the Holy Spirit. Yes, you do. But you need the Holy Spirit right now in some situation you can think of. (laughs) And he is waiting to intervene in that situation He's waiting for you to pray. Pray. It's all through Scripture that heaven is waiting for one person on earth to agree with heaven so that heaven can rend the heavens and the Lord can step down. They're waiting. God's waiting on us. We, uh, we have three um, uh, grown children. I don't know quite. I still don't quite have to figure out how to say that because they're not children they're grown, they're grown adults, but they were born to us. So we have two sons and a daughter who are grown and married. Okay. So uh, Josh, James, Elaine. Uh, Josh was born. Uh, we were not using any birth control and we just didn't feel led to for us. We were ready to have children and Josh was born. And so uh, two years after he was born, I was praying and I thought we would have a daughter next. And I was praying for a daughter. And uh, we turned the lights out, Debbie and I, we prayed. We, we do this nearly every night. We turned the lights out and we pray. And so we prayed. And after we prayed, the Holy Spirit said to me, one year from today, you will have a son. You're to name him James Robert Morris. James after James Robinson and Robert after you. And his ministry will surpass both of your ministries put together. So then, um, that, and, and by the way, the Lord said, and the enemy will try to take his life, but I'll save him. And we felt like he was supposed to be born at home. Josh was a C-section. We talked to doctors, midwives, all that. They said, we feel you'd be okay. And, and I, let me just say, I am not advocating home birth. Debbie is not advocating home birth. <laughs> but we had a word from God. And when he was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, not once, but twice. And his head was blue and face was blue and, and they, the midwife removed it and, and he's still alive today. He's weird, but he's still alive. <laughs> okay, so, 
But when God spoke to me, what did I do? I just sat back and did nothing. No, I prayed. I went to the Lord. You know, Elijah prophesies, it's not going to rain until I say. And then it says, and then he went away and prayed earnestly. So many times we say, well, I've got a word from God. I've got a promise for God, from God. I don't need to do anything. Yes, you do. You need to pray. And you need to pray. Supplication remember, means to pray earnestly, to pray fervently. And so I prayed fervently. And remember, the Lord said, one year from today, we wrote it down, May the 9th. And May the 9th, one year to the day later, James was born. One year, exactly. Because God spoke, not only did God speak, spoke, speak, but we prayed. We went to the Lord about it. So where did they pray? They stayed in relationship in the temple and from house to house. And how did they wait? They waited in prayer. Here's number three, why did they wait? This is the big question. Why did Jesus stay only 40 days. Why did he make them wait 10 days? And by the way, they didn't know it was going to be 10 days. He didn't tell them, wait for Pentecost. And by the way, there were no Pentecostal churches at the time. So they didn't know Pentecost means the day the Holy Spirit comes. They didn't know. They didn't know how long they'd be waiting. But he said, wait. But why? Why did he make them wait? Why does God make people wait? Here, here's the other thing. You can take this word, why, and ask God a whole bunch of questions. Why did I lose my job? Why did this happen? And why didn't this happen? Um, here could, here's, it could be a tough one. Why did my wife get sick? Here's another tough one. I never bring these up to, to bring up a bad memory, but I'm just trying to let us know we have these thoughts. Why did my husband die? Where were you, God? Why did this happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Why? So why does God make us wait? Well, uh, it's a tough question, but it's an easy answer. Uh, you, you might not like the, the answer until I explain it. But sometimes he makes you wait because he's God. And here's what I mean by that. Because he's, he knows more than you know. He is all-knowing. But here's the good part. Not only is he all-knowing, he's all-loving. So his decision to make you wait is because he loves you. He's doing it for your good. He's doing it because he loves you. And he's also making you wait to build your faith. But you need to understand something about faith because I'm gonna take it a, a step further with you that maybe you never thought about. First of all, we gotta understand faith. Well, Hebrews 11 and one, famous definition of faith. Now, faith is the substance, sub, substance of things hoped for. Notice the word hope. The evidence of things not seen. So hope and not seen. That faith is hope that you can't see. Uh, Romans puts it this way, Romans 8, 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Notice the word hope and wait in the same verse. Here's another verse, Look, Lamentations 3.26. It is good, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Why, why is that good? And, and by the way, um, if you already have everything you want, then you actually have no hope. People who have everything don't hope for anything. 
that that's why you hear of a lot of people that have a lot committing suicide because they've lost all hope. If you have everything, you hope for nothing. You have no hope. So why, why do we hope? Why does God make us hope? Okay, he's building our faith. But here's the key. He's actually building your relationship with him. That's how he builds your faith. This is very, 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 very important. <laughs> very, please, boy, this is my burden for the whole message. If you catch this, you catch it all. God's given you a promise, but you can't handle the promise yet. He's building his relationship with you and your relationship with him so that when the promise comes, you can handle it. Remember, the promise was the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. The person came with great power. The reason God doesn't give you the power before you're ready is because it would destroy you. The reason God made the disciples wait 10 days was so they would go deeper in their relationship with God through prayer. And they would get deep enough that when the power of the Holy Spirit came, they'd be able to handle it. Uh, Abraham and Sarah. God made them wait 25 years for the promise. You wanna know why? I got two reasons, but first one is this. They wouldn't have been able to handle the promise until they waited 25 years. And we know that because 11 years into it, Sarah gives her maid to Abraham to sleep with her maid to try to accomplish the promise on their own. And Abraham agrees. that They are not ready to handle the promise. See, I want, I want you to catch this. When we say God's building your faith, we, we, we even say that all the time. We say things like, God's building my faith. He's building my faith. Let me say it a different way. He's building your relationship with him. He's putting a depth in your life so that when the promise comes, you have enough faith in him, you can handle the promise. You won't fail because of the promise. And, and, and let's just say it's a business thing where God, you know God's gonna bless you financially one day, but he give, if he gives you the financial blessing because before you're mature enough to handle it, it will ruin you. He knows that. So he's making you wait. Now, here's, here's the question. If he wasn't going to give the promise to Abraham and Sarah for 25 years, here's a question, good question. Why did he tell them 25 years before? It seems a little mean to me. I mean, God, if you're not gonna give us this child for 25 more years, tell us in 24. And God's thinking, no, it's gonna take you 25 years of knowing and waiting and hoping to have enough maturity to handle this. So that, that's one reason God waits. The second reason is because even though he doesn't own a watch, his timing is always perfect. So Abraham and Sarah's child was named Isaac, right? One day, Abraham's, Abraham sends his servant to his brother household to find a wife for his son Isaac. On the exact day that he sends his servant, on the exact day, his servant gets to a well and Rebecca comes to the well on that day. If Rebecca had come to the well, if Isaac had been born 25 years before, Rebecca 
probably had, was not even born. I want y'all to catch this. God knows. He's got it planned out. He's got your steps planned. He's got every day of your life already planned for perfection for you. It's perfection. I, I know people who, I know, I know a specific couple, 12 years they tried to conceive. 12 years. Then they conceived. And when they came to me and they asked me to pray for them. And when I was praying, I got this word. I said, if your son had been, you're gonna have a son, and if your son had been born 12 years ago, he would have been, he would not, he would never meet his wife. Now, this was like 35 years when I prayed for him. Did you know just a few years ago, they came to me and introduced me to their son's wife? And he met her his freshman year in college. They were both freshmen. If if he'd have been born 12 years earlier, he'd have missed her. She was the right one. Please, please, please hear me. God is smarter than you. (laughs) He knows he's doing it for your good. So Abraham has Isaac at the exact right time so Isaac can meet Rebekah. And Isaac and Rebekah have Jacob at the exact right time so Jacob can meet Rachel. And God does not open Rachel's womb until it's exactly the right time for her to have Joseph. And this continues all the way to a virgin named Mary. And here's the good news. It's still continuing to this day. With your children and your grandchildren, God is determining the days of their lives. God's doing it. It's perfect. And God had Mary born at a certain time so the angel could come to her at a certain time. Scholars believe between the ages of 13 and 16, she was very young, so that Jesus could be born on a certain day so he could begin his ministry at 30 and so at 33, he could die on Passover, so that 50 days later, the Holy Spirit could come on Pentecost, on the exact day, and it started with Abraham and Sarah having to wait 25 years for the promise. I know you're waiting for a promise. But where you need to wait is in relationship with God and relationship with his people. How you need to wait is in prayer. And why you need to pray is because God's doing it for your good. Let me tell you one more story. Um, There was a young lady that you know, but I'm not gonna tell you who she is at this point. But when she was in the second grade, at the end of her second grade year, her teacher didn't feel like her reading was advanced enough to go to the third grade and recommended she repeat the second grade. So it moved her back a year in school. There was also a boy that was born a few days before the cutoff of when he would have to go to school. So he started school early. Instead of starting school, if, it just, if he'd been born just three days later, he would, he would not have been able to start school that year. He'd have started the next year. That boy and that girl, she was supposed to be a grade ahead. He was supposed to be a grade behind, but they ended up in the same grade in sixth grade. 41 years ago, they got married, and 21 years ago, they started a church in their living room called Gateway Church. (laughs) 
God was working it all out. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Everybody here is waiting for a promise from God, waiting for the Holy Spirit to move in some area of your life. I promise you, God loves you. I promise you, he's working it out for your good. I promise you, he has a good plan for you. I want you to stay in relationship with God. Keep your personal relationship with God strong. I want you to keep your, per, your relationship with God's people strong in the temple and from house to house. And I want you to stay in prayer. I want you to believe God and intensely and fervently pray for the promise. And I want you to leave today with a confidence that God loves you and he's doing it for your good. I want you to wait for the promise because the Holy Spirit will come into that situation on the appointed day. Lord, I pray that you would take this word and you will encourage us. And Lord, there are some people here who have been waiting not just 10 days, but 10 years or longer. I pray you will encourage their hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will put something within us that we will stay in relationship with you and with your people, that we will fervently pray and that we will know that we know that we know that you love us and you're working it out for our good. Lord, please apply this message to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Robert, and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others. And click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching.